This morning, I'm going to be talking to you about marine invertebrates. Now, invertebrates are animals without backbones. So in this picture, we see a large number of different animals, most of which are invertebrates, except for the fish. And I think you can grasp from this picture that there's a great deal of competition that's going on in this environment. These animals have to compete for space, and they have to defend themselves against being eaten. Many of them, uh, most of them in this photograph, don't move. That is, they're sessile invertebrates. So they're like the plants in your garden. And the plants, uh, terrestrial plants, are actually the source of most of the drugs that we use today. And uh, marine chemists for several decades now have been looking at these types of animals which face the same sorts of problems that terrestrial plants do as a source of drugs. So, as I pointed out, most of our drugs come from terrestrial plants and microorganisms. And marine invertebrates face the same problems. They can't escape predators. Um, and so chemical warfare is as important in marine ecology as it is in terrestrial ecology. And many of these uh, specialized chemicals that marine animals make have properties that make them useful as drugs. That is, if they, if they are able to defend the animal, they often interact with biological processes that allow them to be used or developed as drugs. And I'm going to give you uh, several examples. Uh, the subject of drugs from the sea is huge. We could spend the whole day on it. So I'm just going to give you a few special examples that I'll talk in more detail about some of the specific research that we do in my laboratory. Uh, this is a case of a sponge. And the drug that is found in this sponge is called theopalaomide, which is an antifungal. And it's not currently under uh, uh, development. Um, and it, the source of, the, of these animals is wild collection. This is another organism, uh, Actinocidia turbinata. The drug is ET7, that it produces is, or that it contains is ET743, which is a very, very promising anti-cancer drug, which is in, currently in human clinical trials and will be introduced uh, as, a, as a drug this year in Europe. The organism is an ascidian, which is uh, commonly called a sea squirt, these, these brown creatures here. And the source for producing this drug is currently aqua aquaculture. And this third example, Bugula narratina, is my favorite organism. It's one that we work a great deal with in my laboratory. The drug that it contains is bryostatin-1. This is also an anti-cancer drug with uh, some very unusual mode of action. It's in cl human clinical trials right now, and it comes from a bryozoan, which is sometimes called a moss animal. The source for development at, the, at present is wild and aquaculture material. So the advantage of marine drugs, why go to the sea to look for marine drugs? Well, the main reason is that we have access to biological diversity that's not present in terrestrial environments. Life evolved in the sea. It diversified in the sea, and a very small part of it crawled up onto the land. And so there's a great deal of diversity in, in the ocean, and that provides us with more different types of potential drugs. However, it's widely known, as you can see from this headline, that it's very diff difficult to develop drugs from the sea. And the biggest problem that is faced is reliable supply. This is because if you're uh, going to develop a drug that comes from an animal that lives, uh, say, in the deep sea and is fairly rare, it's very difficult to, gain, to get enough material uh, economically to be able to produce it as a drug. So there are problems of drugs from marine invertebrates. Chemical synthesis is sometimes not practical. Some of these organisms can be grown by aquaculture, but some can't, especially the ones that live in the deep sea. And the source organism may be rare or difficult or expensive to collect, or equally important, collection may be destructive to the environment. If you have to collect them as sponges often are done by dredging, um, or uh, in the case of some of these animals, they provide habitat for other organisms. And so uh, the, the process of collection can be a real problem in, its, in and of itself. So this is where I come in. I'm a marine microbiologist, and my major interest is symbiosis that is, bacteria that live with animals. And in the past, I've done a lot of work on bioluminescent fishes, and you can see some of that here in the aquarium. 
Um, now I've become interested in bacteria that uh, form these relationships with invertebrates. So symbiosis simply means living together. It's a fairly neutral term. The relationship can benefit either one or both partners. If it's both partners, it's called a mutualism, uh, but it can also simply benefit one of the partners. And of course, in the, in the marine environment, there are many different kinds of symbioses between bacteria and animals, and some that you might be familiar with are the chemoautotrophic symbi symbioses that are found in hydrothermal vents. These are the huge vestimentiferin worms that live near the hydrothermal vents, and they're supported entirely by bacteria that live inside them and use the chemicals that come out of the hydrothermal vents to uh, make food, much the way plants use the energy of sunlight to make food, and they support these huge communities at the hydrothermal vents. And these are called chemoautotrophic symbioses. And the bioluminescent symbioses, this is a deep sea anglerfish, and it has a little light organ that contains bioluminescent bacteria that it uses to lure food that it can then eat. So this is another example of a bacterial animal symbiosis, and these are very prevalent in marine environments. So now let's bring in the chemistry. Marine chemists over the last several decades have, have frequently um, begun to propose that the compounds that they're extracting from these marine invertebrates are maybe really coming from bacteria that are associated with them, that are living with them, possibly as a chemical defense. Um, and this shows an example of why chemists think that way. This is a compound. You can see it's a pretty complicated structure. And if you uh, had to imagine the biosynthesis of it, it would uh, take a lot of evolutionary steps to m make something this complicated. This is called trisoxazoline from Lysocline and Bistratum, which is an acidian. That's a sea squirt. It's been extracted from that animal. The same exact compound is also known as westeliamide from a cyanobacterium. That's a that's a bacterium that is, uh, can use light as energy. And the likelihood of these two completely unrelated organisms evolving a pathway to make exactly the same compound seems a bit far-fetched. What's more, this acidium, acidian contains cyanobacterial symbionts. So you, you can see it's not a huge leap to imagine that maybe these bacteria are making the compound that provides some benefit to the sea squirt. So why do marine invertebrates need to form these uh, relationships in order to make the chemicals? Why don't they just make them themselves? And the argument behind that is an evolutionary one. This shows a, an evolutionary tree where the length of the lines uh, is an indication of the evolutionary distance between the organisms that are at the ends of each one of the lines. So here are the bacteria. The archaea are another type of organism that is also single cell like bacteria and used to be considered bacteria, but is another entire group. The eukarya are the, are the organisms that contain nuclei. And multicellular eukaryotes, that, that is ones that are big enough for you to see with the naked eye, is just a tiny little part of this tree. So you can see that most of the evolutionary diversity of life resides in the microbes. So, Although the multicellular eukaryotes are the pioneers of size and structural complexity and are mostly what we see when we look at that reef picture in the beginning, the microbes are the kings of evolutionary and metabolic diversity, and they can make many more different kinds of chemical compounds than the eukaryotes can. So in, in some cases, it's going to be easier for one of these multicellular eukaryotes to make a partnership with, with an organism over here to create the, the chemical that they need to defend themselves than to evolve that pathway themselves. So this presents certain opportunities because if in those cases where the, the, the chemicals that are produced by the marine invertebrates, and that's certainly not all cases, but in those cases, it may be possible to manufacture the drugs without collecting animals from the wild if we can exploit these symbioses. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We've begun to do research on these marine chemical symbioses, and I'll, I will give you some examples of all of these different types of approaches. In order to prove that, that, the, that the chemical is due to a symbiosis, 
there are, are several types of, of approaches we can take. We can use chemical localization, that is separating the, ba the bacteria from the host and finding that the chemistry is in the bacteria. We can identify the microbes without cultivation. This is important because we now know that more than 99% of bacteria in the environment can't be cultivated in a laboratory. We can also try to clone the biosynthetic genes that make these chemicals to make the drugs in the laboratory. So why does it make a difference whether it's a symbiosis for cloning? The reason is because bacterial genes are, ver are usually very nicely organized in groups and packages that can be easily cloned uh, a whole pathway at a time. And in animals, that's usually not the case. And of course, we can also try to cultivate the symbionts in the laboratory and then just grow them to make drugs the way you uh, use yeast to make beer. So the first example that I'll talk about is this sponge here, which makes the, the drug theopalaomide. This is an example where chemical localization has been very successful. My colleague John Faulkner and his group are a pioneer, are, are pioneers in this area. They're marine chemists. And his graduate student, Carol Bewley, did a, an elegant study where she, dis, she disrupted the sponge, ground it up, separated the sponge cells from the cells of these bacteria, which are gigantic filamentous bacteria, very unusual looking bacteria. And she was able to detect using chemical methods that the drug theopalaomide was inside these bacterial cells. So we knew that they were the source of this compound. Some work that was later done uh, in collaboration with John's group and my group, we were able to, uh, to identify the symbionts by cloning out genes that are used to compare different bacteria. And this is another evolutionary tree where the length of the lines indicates the distance between the bacteria. This group here are the mixobacteria, which are common soil bacteria and the source of a lot of, of, of interesting drugs. These are the symbionts that live in the sponge. And each one of these lines represents symbionts from a different sponge. And each sponge, in, in each sponge, those symbionts make a slightly different version of these compounds. And so we can see that as these, uh, as the sponge evolves and the bacteria evolve, their chemistry evolves as well, providing a tremendous diversity of compounds that have biological activity. We can label those genes with a, 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 a chemical that glows and be able to see our particular large filaments in a mixture of bacteria. So this is a, an ordinary uh, view through a microscope of the very complicated mixture of bacteria present in the sponge. But if we label them with this specific label, we can see these huge filaments uh, specifically in the sponge. And most exciting of all, we've actually been able to propagate these bacteria outside of the host. This is the same label uh, uh, that glows. And although the bacteria that we're growing contains other bacteria, these are not a pure culture, still the ones that we're interested in are able to multiply outside of the host. So there's the possibility of being able to grow these bacteria and produce the drug. This is the sea squirt, <clears throat> Actinocidia turbinata, which makes the anti-cancer drug. This is one that is very close to uh, actually being uh, used in humans for normal clinical treatment. And what we've discovered is that the larvae of this animal, this is, these are microscopic pictures of the, the larvae. The larvae are released, they swim around, and then they settle and form a new colony. This is using one of these labeled genes that's labeled with a glowing chemical. And what we can see is that it appears that these larvae are full of bacteria. And again, the compound, the, the anti-cancer compound, ET743, is one that looks very much like something that's made by some soil bacteria. And so we, be we believe that there are bacteria associated with this um, sea squirt that are actually carried in the larvae so that when it starts a new colony, it's sure to have its chemicals and its bacteria. And uh, so this is a very early stage of this project, but we're really excited about it.
This is my favorite organism, Bugula narratina, the bryozoan, <clears throat> which produces uh, bryostatin-1, which is the anti-cancer compound. It's not really a very photogenic marine invertebrate compared to many. It, most people think it's a brown alga, um, but it actually is an animal. It's considered to be a nuisance. It grows on people's boats, has to be scraped off. Most of the funding for research on Bugula narratina has focused on discouraging it from growing on people's boats. Well, really, the Navy's boats. <laughs> However, it's a very familiar organism. It was first described in 1758 by Linnaeus in his 10th edition of the Systema Naturae. So, you know, for 250 years that we've known about this organism, and it's been a common research subject for biologists, invertebrate biologists, who's particularly who study the development of invertebrates. And this shows a close-up of what you might see under the microscope when they're relaxed and, and comfortable. They will put out these feeding structures called a lophophore, and they capture tiny particles, little, little uh, single-celled plants and other little bits of stuff, and that's what they eat. One of the wonderful things about this organism is that even though it is so familiar to us, it still has the ability to surprise us by um, the discovery of the, these anti-cancer compounds, the bryostatins, and also um, the bacteria, which I'll show you in a minute. This shows the life cycle of Bugula narratina. The colony has uh, special structures which contain larvae, which are uh, little uh, ciliated uh, fuzzy balls that swim around. They don't feed, and they swim around for a short time and settle and form a new colony, which then develops its feeding structure and then begins to grow and then to branch. We've, uh, it, it contains bacterial symbionts in the larvae, just like the sea squirt does. They're in a specialized structure, this ring, around the uh, top of the larva. And you can see these bacteria here. Here they are labeled with a gene, again, that's been labeled in this case with a brown stain and you can actually see those bacteria in the larvae. So this, is, again, is a case where the animal cares enough about these bacteria to put them into the larvae so that when it starts a new colony, it's sure to have them. Uh, we've discovered that it's a new species of bacterium. We haven't yet succeeded in growing this one, and it's found in both the larvae and the adults in all populations of this animal. We've also been able to clone out uh, small, in this case, a small gene fragment from a biosynthetic gene of the sort that we expect to be responsible for the biosynthesis of the drug, bryostatin. And this shows us another one of these staining experiments. This shows the stain that we use for identifying the bacteria, and, and here they are in, the, uh, in that structure in the larva. And this shows where this gene is being expressed. So we have uh, cloned a part of a gene of the right sort to produce this drug and found that, it's, that it is being used, this gene, in the bacteria, not in the host. And this is, um, gives us reason to believe that, uh, that the bacteria are possibly the source of the bryostatins. We've gone forward from that and cloned out the, what we think is the whole biosynthetic pathway for making this drug. Um, and it's huge. This shows that it's uh, about 73 kilobases long. Your ordinary average enzyme that makes most of the chemicals in your body is about one kilobase. Uh, so this is absolutely huge. So if, um, in fact, the, uh, you think of an enzyme as being like a tool, like a wrench or something like that, this enzyme complex is like a factory. It's a huge, very, very complicated um, group of proteins that do an amazingly complex series of steps to make this very complicated molecule. So what we're working on right now is expressing these genes in a, an organism that's easy to grow in the laboratory so we can produce all the bryostatin that's needed for treating cancer. What sort of cancer is bryostatin uh, useful for? It was first developed for uh, or it was first screened against leukemia cells. And so leukemia is the first cancer that it was really studied for. It's also useful for lymphoma and melanoma, 
and it's currently in clinical trials for a number of different solid tumors, and it has some very special properties that make it useful in treatment of breast cancer. Briostatin is not a cytotoxic compound as some, um, as most of the chemotherapeutic agents that we're used to using now. It actually interferes with the signaling pathways in the cells. So in leukemia, it causes the cells to complete their process of development and become a normal blood cell rather than remaining immature and, and dividing rapidly. And it also stimulates the production of immune system cells. So for example, in what's called adoptive immunotherapy, uh, you take the tumor from a breast tumor and you recover the immune cells from the tumor. Then those have to be grown out in the laboratory for a period of time. They can then be put back into the patient where because they've already learned to recognize the tumor, they'll go through the body and attack the metastases and the, uses the patient's own immune system. One thing bryostatin-1 can be used for is that if you treat those immune cells with bryostatin-1, you can put them directly back into the patient without having to grow them out in the laboratory. It also um, reverses multidrug resistance so that if you have a, re a recurrence of cancer, you can use the same drugs that were used the first time. It also um, provides, makes those drugs much stronger. It helps, it's, it's uh, um, synergistic, it has a synergistic effect. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, and very different type of drug and it may be useful in many different kinds of cancer. So in con the conclusions I want to have you take away are that using state-of-the-art microbiology research can contribute to our understanding of these marine symbioses, how they evolved, why they evolved, what they are doing for the animals, but also the results of this research may help to solve the supply problem for some of these marine drugs and help unlock the potential of marine biodiversity for human benefit. And I've had a, a wonderful group of talented and dedicated researchers working with me at at Scripps, um, both in my laboratory and in the laboratory of my colleague John Faulkner, as well as at the University of Minnesota in the laboratory of David Sherman. Thank you. Um, plants use the, the, uh, the energy of sunlight to make their own food. Um, and that's why it matters in your garden whether they're in the sun or in the shade. And you don't have to feed them other than mineral nutrients. Animals uh, have to use food that's been made by a plant, ultimately. So in the case of the, the bryozoan, it's catching these tiny one-celled plants as its food. Uh, he would like to know whether, um, whether there's any work being done on using these in a preventative way, nutritionally. And I would say, no, there isn't. Uh, not that there might not be some benefits, but uh, as far as I know, there's no research going on on that. Well, let's take the example of bryostatin. Um, bryostatin was discovered by a group at, the, at Arizona State University, and Bristol-Myers Squibb licensed that patent from the Arizona State University. Most of the research in clinical trials has been supported by the National Cancer Institute, not by Bristol-Myers. And actually, Bristol-Myers dropped the license recently because the, the, the drug goes off patent fairly soon. All of the material for the clinical trials was obtained from wild material, and that involved collecting tons and tons of this bryozoan and extracting the very tiny amounts of the drug that are present in it. So all of that material is now, it's now in the hands of the National Cancer Institute. Um, there are many clinical trials for a number of different cancers going on both in the U.S. and Europe. And uh, for people who want to, to be involved in testing these drugs, clinical trials are currently the only way to go. They're not being produced commercially for any doctor to use. In the case of ET743, the one that's being made by the, the uh, C-squirt, that also is in clinical trials. It's being developed by a company, a Spanish company called Pharmamar, and they are actually supporting clinical trials in Europe. They are actually doing a lot of work to develop the drug, and that's why I can confidently say that that drug is going to be in the market next year. Where are hydrothermal vents? 
Well, the ones that are the most famous are at the bottom of the ocean along the ridges and rifts uh, in the, in the uh, deep sea. But in fact, hydrothermal just means hot water. And the, hot wa the water is heated geothermally. And so if you had something like a geyser, like Old Faithful, but underwater, that would be a hydrothermal vent. And so there actually are some shallow water hydrothermal vents just south of here in, uh, in Baja, California. So they can be in shallow water or in deep water, but the ones that are the most famous for these tremendous communities are in, deep, in the deep sea. You know, can these kinds of compounds be developed for preventive purposes? Yes. Um, if you look at the biological and metabolic diversity that's available in the ocean, of course there are going to be compounds that have these kinds of properties. The, the, the difficulty is um, funding that research because something that's going to be used nutritionally has to be absolutely safe. Whereas something that's going to be used to treat cancer that somebody's going to die of otherwise can have some side effects. And so the amount of testing that's required to develop a nutritional supplement is, is going to be much more burdensome to a company than treating cancer. And that's the one reason that so many ca companies go into the uh, cancer, uh, developing the cancer drugs. But as far as the, the biochemical potential is concerned, it's there.